Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Neutral Game Podcast. I am Colin Detmar, and I'm joined, as always, by Mia Drag. Hello. And uh, this time, we're here to discuss um, character archetypes. Sort of, um, if you look at fighting games and you look at sort of the way the characters are designed in in combat, very commonly you can break them down into certain categories, and there are a lot of more fine categories, but today we're sort of going to discuss four general categories. These categories primarily apply to 2D games rather than 3D, because 3D throws a lot of this out the window, though not all of them. And there are always going to be exceptions, because fighting games are great, and they make variations on these designs, and so nothing... You're not going to have a whole ton of characters that fit super neatly into one category or another. Yeah, I'd say always keep in mind that the, how a character works depends on the actual game they're in. So you'll often not have um, very clear-cut universal types. It's more like this is this equivalent of a Shoto type and things like mm-hmm. that. And um, also, it depends on your personal play style, right? Like, I think the way... Mia Drag plays uh, Hakumen in Blaze Blue is generally fairly rushed down, and that's not what people tend to play Hakumen as. Uh, um, yeah, generally the better games will uh, let you wedge in uh, your own style, um, although, mm-hmm. of course, each character in each game will have their most optimal strategy. Yeah. So, I guess the purpose of this list is sort of twofold. One, it is to help you figure out what you're interested in as a fighting game player, and then with that information, know what to look for when picking up a new character. If you're picking up a new game, you can be like, oh, I like this style of play, so I should maybe be looking at these characters. And then also, to a certain extent, knowing what to expect when facing other characters in matchups. But that's, as as we said, because of the the way different play styles can affect these characters, that's way less reliable. So um, I'll go ahead and take the first one, which is the uh, the Shoto, um, which has, frankly, the dumbest names. Most of these names are going to be fairly like, oh, of course, that describes what it is, right? But the Shoto is a term that has been established in fighting game canon um, because of actually a translation of the manual for Street Fighter II, in which they described the characters Ken and Ryu, sort of the main characters of the game, as using Shotokan Karate, um, which is not true. They don't. Um, That's just a bad translation, but it's it's sort of stuck, and now all characters that are like Ken and Ryu, people call Shotos. I'm going to level with you. I did not actually know this, and uh, I actually thought that Shoto referred to, like, shooting so it's a character that spans oh. projectiles. So um, yeah, I've learned something new today. Oh, that would have that would have made more sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. No, they. Uh, it's just for some reason they translated. Uh, f- if you care, um, what they the martial art they actually use is referred to as ansatsuiken or the assassin's fist, and for some reason they just decided when localizing it to call it Shotokan Karate, and that's just completely wrong. Also, that's a real martial art and has nothing to do with the one that Ken and Ryu use, it's a baffling choice. Well, uh, you have to keep in mind that when these kind of games are, or especially back in the day, when these kind of games were localized, nobody really expected them to become massive, successful franchises. So localization would usually focus on what would be most appealing to the current market. So I'm guessing Shotokan maybe sounded cooler because that's what early 90s trends were with martial arts movies. So they were like, oh, let's capitalize on this, and then translate it, not knowing the consequences. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So the thing about Shotos is that they tend to be fairly um, jack-of-all-trades characters. Um, Obviously, the design can be pushed in one way or another, but they tend to be really flexible, versatile characters who have tools for most situations. They'll have... Uh, a projectile, which usually is is considered to be like fireball-style projectiles. They're projectiles that you throw in a straight line forward so that they have a very predictable path and the enemy sort of has to deal with them as opposed to ones that have a more strange trajectory. Um, they tend to have a reversal, which is a, uh, 
a move that you can use that often is very fast and has some invincibility on it so that if someone gets in your face and is pressuring you, you can force them to back off. Um, and so um, they they generally play a game of like using their fireballs to sort of force you to approach in a predictable manner and then punishing you for being predictable. Um, there is, to a certain extent, an assumption with Shoto's also of control scheme, and these are, like, literally the only character archetype I know where there is an assumption that they will control a certain way. They usually control in quarter circles, which is, you know, a, a quarter of a circle motion with your with your stick. Um, that's only important to know because the community will use that terminology. I think it's a really stupid uh, delineation. I don't think it really has any value. Um, but yeah, that's that's sort of generally the, the Shoto style. They try to force you to play their game, and then they try and play it better than you. Um, they're very flexible, but they need to use every tool they have, or they're going to fail. Uh, they're generally um, used as poster boys uh, for video games, and I don't think it's necessarily because of... Um... Ryan and Ken being the poster boys of Street Fighter, and now every Shoto has to be a poster boy. Uh, it's more along the lines of uh, th- these characters are the easiest to pick up, and when you have them the most in your promotional material, uh, covers and things like that, you know people uh, will see them on the cover, then turn on the game, and then see a bunch of characters, and they'll be like, oh, I'll just pick the one that's the main character. Um, and that's uh, quite usually the, the intent, like... Um, that's usually done so that players wouldn't be discouraged. Like, if you accidentally pick a character that's too complicated and you're unifying games, you might just bounce off the game. Um, mm-hmm. And they also tend to be kind of the baseline characters of a uh, fine game, uh, in the sense of every other character will be compared to them. Uh, because they have the basic tools, they have very good tools, uh, every other character will be kind of a focus on another aspect compared to the show. Like, for example, you, let's say you have, you know, uh, Kai Kiske in Guilty Gear who shoots lightning bolts. And then when you compare him to, let's say, uh, Ramlethal, uh, who has projectiles with swords, then you'll go along the lines of, oh, okay, Ramlethal is like a Kai Kiske focused on projectiles, but she has different weaknesses. So it's it's usually kind of like this baseline, and if you learn those characters, you kind of learn the basic rules of the game as well. Mm-hmm. And so it's 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 a good like starting point just for understanding. I mean, fighting games in general, and also understanding the particular game, because seeing how differently games do shadows can be interesting. For example, um, the the I would say probably. King of Fighters' best Shoto is Terry Bogard. Um, but you'll notice that he's kind of a weird one because, like, for example, his fireball projectile travels along the ground. It's really easy to dodge his projectile. Um, and that sort of betrays the game's interest. The game is not generally super interested in you standing in a range and throwing fireballs at each other. It thinks fireballs are a useful thing to have around, but it wants you to get in the other person's face. And you can kind of tell that from Terry's design. Yeah, or if you look at Blaze Blue, you know, Jin's projectiles are special because they can freeze you uh, temporarily. So even then, the game tells you our most basic characters are going to have unique special gimmicks to them. Mm -hmm. And in the case of a game I've been playing a lot lately, uh, Skullgirls, the only Shoto in that game is Double, who is a weird, shape-shifting, like, body horror character. And the message there is, we're not really interested in Shotos. Um, Yeah. So. It's also worth noting, um, so we've talked about these these examples, which are are rather straightforward Shotos, but there's also, within games, a lot of times, a sort of a spin on the Shoto. Like, in in Street Fighter, it's Akuma, who is obviously in his moveset, fairly similar to Ryu and Ken, but the way he's built, he's built to be way more aggressive and in-your-face, and uh, it's sort of interesting to see the spins people take on that design as well. Do you want to take the next one? Um, yeah, um, so the next um, kind of archetype we wanted to cover is uh, the Zoner, uh, which has a more straightforward name. 
Um, mm-hmm. It basically refu- refers to uh, characters who have uh, zone controlling ab- abilities. Um, so they control uh, the battlefield with their abilities, like uh, using a lot of projectiles, good projectiles, um, that either travel fast, cover a lot of space, cover a lot of different angles, uh, or things like traps and generally denying um, your opponent's movement. Um, and they also have uh, their normal moves reflecting that, like far-reaching pokes and moves that let them escape from uh, close-quarter combat, which is usually what their weakness is, because um, I guess it's the most straightforward design to that. Um, because if you were to make a zoner who is also really good at close range, uh, you kind of end up with a very uh, weird character that's kind of hard to overcome because you have to think, okay, how do I get close to a character? And then when you get close to a character, is how do I capitalize on that? Whereas with classic zoners, it's more like you get into the character's face and then they're helpless. Um, and also, in terms of game feel, when you have a character that is like, like oh, like amazing zoning ability, but then when you get in their face, they can do good things too. It's also just confusing to the player because they don't know what they're supposed to focus on. So, Yeah, it's, it's usually because um, I guess the only thing then left is mid-range. Uh, or just Mm -hmm. capitalizing on your opponent's mistakes. Uh, But those are very weird concepts uh, to grasp on on an entry level. Uh, I mean, telling someone Mm -hmm. what mid-range is is a very wide area uh, on the screen compared to close and far. Um, So it's kind of like, where exactly in mid-range should I be? Uh, Which is why usually you have zoners being those uh, glass cannons. Um, I guess the one I'm most familiar with was probably Blaze Blues' owner, um, uh, which was basically New 13, but then she got a name change to Lambda 11, and then it's basically the the little girl with all the knives flying around her. <laughs> I think that's the best way to describe her. Um, and she was really weird because um, um, in that game, she's a one-button projectile character, and usually you don't have much of that. Uh, usually projectiles in games require you to do some uh, directional motion, like down forward, down back, and then a button. Uh, but she was one because of the way the game worked. Uh, she had one button for projectiles, and then she mixes it up with down, back, forward, or an actual motion for harder stuff. Um, and just to give you an example, of how these characters can be frustrating. Um, she was actually in the first game uh, the most powerful character, as in. Out of ten matches, she would win nine matches against every single other character uh, in the ca- in the game, except one. Against one, she had eight to two, so it was a tad ridiculous. But and she's also also these kind of characters are often hated because they uh, very easily break down um, uh, novice players um, because when you when, when you're playing say a shadow character, you kind of have to focus on close quarters, mid quarters, your long distance game, uh, you have to be good at quite a lot of aspects, or every aspect of the game. But when you're playing a zoner, on the lowest level of play, you really only need to be good at uh, shooting your projectile and staying out of the way of your opponent, which is much, e- which are far less and far easier things to actually focus on. Yeah, and I feel like there's also a, a lot of them being hated because of how frustrating they can be to fight. Because, um, you know, like a lot of characters, you're fighting at ranges where you're better at things than the other person is, but they still have options. And zoners excel by putting you in situations where they have options and you have none. Your options are to just sort of, like, defend and try and get past what they're doing because you do not have any way of retaliating. And psychologically, that's very frustrating for people. They have to play way more patient and careful than they would like to. Yeah, I mean, just to give an example, going back to Blaze Blue, but a different character, like, I've learned to play against uh, Nu slash Lambda, and she got quite nerfed. But then uh, there's another zoner, um, Arakune, which is this uh, black blob thing that curses you and then just throws projectiles from all angles, like behind you, in front of you, under you. It's a bit crazy. And to this day, like, I've actually played against one last month, and I got destroyed, and it's 
literally not like I lost the game. It's more like it looked like I wasn't even holding my controller. So that's how mm-hmm. bad you can actually get broken by these characters. And why it's so frustrating because... You know, because it's a video game, inherently you want to input something and get a response. But when you're being denied that and you can never input anything, uh, that frustrates you because you don't feel like you're actually playing. Yeah, for sure. And that's one of the... There are multiple character styles that take advantage of that. I think the next one does to an extent as well. Just sort of this, like, basic urge as, as a player to be like, I should be doing something right now. Sometimes you really shouldn't, and that's okay. Yeah, just to clarify on sometimes you shouldn't be doing anything, um, that mostly refers to sometimes you should just not press a button uh, Mm -hmm. because the opponent expects you to press a button and wants to punish you for that. Like, for example, if the button makes you stand up and you press the stand up as soon as possible, your opponent who is a zoner expects that, and you're just back into the meat grinder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we mentioned uh, Lambda Eleven in Blaze Blue um, as as one of those zoners. Um, another example would be you know most people know Dalsim from Street Fighter with his, yeah. his stretchy limbs and his fireballs. That's a pretty classic one. Um, and also because I'm on a I'm on a Skullgirls tear lately. Peacock is oh my god, she's one of the most annoying. She's really fun to play, but she's one of the most annoying zoners I've ever seen. It's it's unreal because she has projectiles that come like fireballs straight across. She has quite a few of those. She has a reversal if you get in close. She has a teleport with invulnerability, and she has projectiles that drop from the sky. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah, I, um, I I like her design, but I've never enjoyed playing or playing against her. I enjoyed playing her because I'm a bad person, but you know. Um, to, to, to go back to Dalsim. Um, I, I guess here uh, playing against all Sims reminds me of uh, one of my general qualms with um, uh, fighting zoners is that it doesn't usually feel like you're playing the the game. It feels like you're playing a single player boss, and you're trying to find what openings you have in the pattern. Um, mm-hmm. And that's how I, I feel in Blaze Blue. But that's how I always felt with the uh, Dalsim as well. It was more like. Oh, he can cover all these areas, and he has an optimal strategy, and I just have to actually find a way to approach him. So it's it's kind of like playing a shmup or a bullet hell game, where you're just avoiding stuff, trying to get closer. Yeah, a lot of these characters, when they're really on, like of 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 multiple styles, uh, they change the nature of the game, and you're not playing, you know, you're not playing Street Fighter, you're playing versus Dalsim. Exactly. Um, and, you know, I, like, that can be cool, just the fact that the nature of the game is changing, but it's also, it can be really frustrating how much influence these characters, you know, exude simply by their presence, so. Yeah, and, and also generally a pro tip, if you're learning a game, um, try and focus on not playing uh, against zoners all the time, if you can, because uh, if you learn to play against a zoner or some any exotic character, essentially, uh, you will be at a loss at some of the game's basic rules when you're playing against mm-hmm. uh, Shadows or other uh, more mainstream characters. Yeah, if you face any one type of thing too much, it's really easy to develop bad behaviors that don't work against most of the cast. Um, like, I, I remember there are some, like, it's going to be hard for me to come up with a specific example because it's been a long time. But I remember when I used to play a bunch of uh, Street Fighter 3, I would play a certain matchup all the time with Q, and I would use one of his moves constantly, and basically it was unsafe in almost all matchups in the game, but in the one I was doing it was safe, and so I just got used to using it constantly. And then I faced someone else, and they just punished me all the time, and I got wrecked. Yep. So you need to you need to vary who you fight, if, if at all possible. Um just to have a better, broader picture of what your character can do and not make bad assumptions. Yeah. And also, um, uh, earlier Colin made the comment of he plays Peacock because he's a uh, horrible person. Um, j- just to note, any like all, all of these are just archetypes, so if you like the sound of one over the other, don't let anyone tell you, oh, you're 
a less honorable fire for picking this character or not. Just play what you like. Yeah, that I was. That's really worth saying. I was joking. If you don't know me very well, I was. I was teasing. I have fun with Peacock, and that's fine. Yeah. Now we can move um, on to the next one. True thing. So our next style is Rushdown, um, which it does basically what it so- sounds like. They are rushing at you and and locking you down. Um, these are characters that want to get generally up close and personal with just constant offense and pressure. They want to get up to you. They want to keep you blocking with attacks that they can just sort of continuously throw out until they make you sort of cave to the pressure and they get a good hit. Um, these are going to be characters that, like, I find um, they're, you know, they're tricky to try and keep that... Um, like, one, you usually don't have very good options at long range, and that can be frustrating. And two, it can be hard to know the timings and know what's safe to keep up your pressure sustainably. But I have found getting newer players into the game that they find rushdown characters really rewarding and satisfying. Just because it feels good to get up in their face and just start punching, you know? Just on a, a basic level. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think um, it's also... Yeah, go on. I don't know. It's, there's not much more to it than that. I guess there are there are multiple styles. There are characters that want to um, just sort of keep you blocking and chip away at your health. There are characters that want to get you blocking and then start like doing moves that you have to block differently. Like there are characters that do high low mix ups where they start start you blocking and then they do overheads that you have to block standing, and then they do lows that you have to block low, and you just have to keep your head and keep an eye out and guess what they're going to do and keep blocking right. And then there are characters that uh, have unblockable setups, and I'm not a huge fan of that, to be honest, but they get you blocking, and then they take the moment that you're sitting there blocking, afraid, and expecting the next move, and charge up a move that you can't block, and they get damaged that way. To, con- uh, to um, talk about what you said earlier, that these tend to be uh, more popular characters with new players. I think it's... Um... And that ties back to the zoner talk, where we said you have to focus on two things, um, getting away and just using projectiles. I think a good uh, power of playing a zoner is you have less things to worry about than a um, shadow character, because you lack the zoning tools, like the projectiles. But Mm -hmm. um, if you're playing a character that needs to get up close and deal damage, that's going to be useful in more situations then a zoners keep you at range because if you uh, you're gonna fight more characters that need to fight you at close quarters and you're gonna fight characters that are uh gonna keep you at distance so generally that's why rushdown might be so appealing because you're focusing on something that has immediate feedback and something that's gonna be useful across far more matches yeah that's a good point yeah um, so if you're looking for some good some good rushdown characters for yourself, some examples um, would be uh, Yoon and Yang, the twins from, from Street Fighter. Um, they're an interesting sort of subset of rushdown characters where they have dive kicks, which are these moves you can use from the air to sort of affect your trajectory and come down with an attack. They allow you to do really good, safe, consistent pressure and, and screw people up. Um, you might want uh, Makoto from Blaze Blue who, uh, oh my god, she can keep you blocking for so long. It's it's intense. Um, and of course, um, it says a lot about Guilty Gear that the main character, the guy on the cover, Soul Bad Guy, is a, is a rushdown character. That sort of speaks to that game's interests, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's hard for me to comment on clear examples for this one, because usually I uh, refer to rushdown as a strategy, which is, mm-hmm. like, I, I learned to uh, play most characters I focus on as something that can do pressure. Like, as you said uh, at the start of the podcast, that I, I play a aggressive Hakuman. Um, I, I usually just do that out of, you know, that being the optimal style at the moment for me to do. Uh, but mm-hmm. definitely there are characters that reward that far more than other characters do. Yeah, it's 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 a weird thing because a lot of these, like, some of them will, some of them won't. But to a certain extent, these definitions are going to fall away as you get better at the game. And you're just going to sort of think of them in terms of what tool sets they use and what click with your style, you know? 
because yeah, there are there are characters that I've played that were not meant to be rushed down that I played that way. There were characters I've played who it seemed to me like they were meant to be played rushed down that I did not. Um, actually, there's a really interesting example recently. Um, so in King of Fighters 13, one of the members of my team was King. King has a lot of kicks, and she has some pretty good pressure tools, and she also has a fireball. And in King of Fighters 13, she could do that fireball in the air. It was not one of the better fireballs in the game, but almost no one in that game can do a fireball in the air. And I used that to play King as a keep-away zoner with a super obnoxious wall of air fireballs that made it almost impossible to get in. Um, and then King of Fighters 14 came out and they took away her air fireball and I can't do that anymore. And I feel like, I feel like it was a specific reaction to me playing a rushdown character as a zoner. Yeah, that, that, it's always bad when you lose, uh, uh, tools you're used to in uh, game transitions like that. Mm -hmm. I've definitely felt it a few times. And sometimes, you know, sometimes... Like, in that case, I feel like I kind of have to concede that I was probably, like, I don't know, that was that was not the design intention, is what I was doing, and it, I know for a fact that it wasn't very fun for the people I was fighting against, so it's probably good design of them to take it away from me, but, you know, it's still, it's still like, I pick up King, and I jump in the air, and I do a quarter circle forward and hit kick, and nothing happens, and I have a moment of, wait, what? And then someone hits me, so... Um, to, to go on a bit on a tangent, I, I don't really agree that that might be good design um I, i'm uh, this isn't like a specific example i'm more paraphrasing it but i believe in the old guilty gears um anji which is the guy with two fans um he had a really good mix-up i wasn't sure if it was unblockable i think it might have been unblockable and a lot of people were using it um so when the next version of the game came out they, the devs basically said okay so we didn't expect people to use this tool in this way. And uh, it's okay that you're using it, but we're going to tone it down. So they still left the option in, but they made it cost a super meter. Like you need to use a quarter of your meter to actually execute it. Um, huh. So I think it was something along those lines. Um, but essentially, if you see people, that's at least my philosophy. If you see people playing a game a or a certain way or using a certain strategy if it's not intended and it's not exactly breaking your game um try and figure out why people are using that and um try and give something to those people like it doesn't have to be as good but maybe still give them that kind of option because i think in, in a very skill-based game player expression is really important at least that's that's my approach to things you know every every game has their own philosophy and approach to balancing. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's a really good point, and um, I wish they'd done that. Maybe but in fifteen. What can you do? Maybe in fifteen, or maybe with some some patch because they're releasing a bunch of new characters, and I'm sure they'll do some some patches to the game. So yeah. So let's go on to a, a, a last character type that I guess I've always I've always thought of as being really your wheelhouse, and I think about it, and I don't know why I thought that. Um. So, yeah, grapplers aren't exactly my wheelhouse. I'm not too big on grapplers. It's just that I've played against so many of them, and I have some deep, deep scars from my time of playing fighting games. Because, um, so grapplers are essentially the usually the big, bulky characters that uh, grab you and do a lot of damage. So they don't have... Mm -hmm. um, that many zoning tools or combo potential or generally um, the tools you'd expect other characters to have, it's usually they have a lot of tools and moves that let them capitalize on their throws. And they usually have command throws, so a special um, subcategory, which is um, requires a special input. Let's, let's say in um, Guilty Gear, you grab a character... Uh, by pressing uh, a button and forward while you're close to them. But grapplers, while having that, they will also have something like uh, press quarter circle back, forward, and then a button, and then grab a character. 
And if that motion sounds complicated, it's because it usually functions as a balancing tool um, to make those moves manageable. Because mm-hmm. if because they they're so damaging, they do a lot of damage. They usually stun if the game has a stun uh, uh, like mechanic. Uh, so you have to balance it out by making it take long enough to actually execute them. Um, and they again, they, they have a lot of tools that assist them in achieving what they have. It's not just moves, but it's like move properties. Like they would have, for for example, if they do a special that's a punch forward, that punch forward might have armor properties on it, which means that if somebody attacks them, uh, they will take damage, but they won't be interrupted out of their move, which then usually leads to uh, them inputting a throw while their armor is active and then grabbing the character who just tried to punch them. Mm-hmm. And another thing that really, um, like this is maybe getting a little too far into to game strategy, but a really key thing to learn and to watch out for against grapplers is like a lot of these times, as, as Mio said, a lot of these times they're command throw moves, they're really damaging ones, uh, have inputs that are really hard to do quickly and sometimes have some some telegraphs. Like, a lot of the times they'll ask you to do a full 360 degree rotation of your stick. If you do that just standing, unless you are really good, I have seen some people who can just do it and you can't tell, but most people, because at some point in that you input up, they'll jump in the middle of that animation. And it's like, oh, they just jumped. Obviously, they're going for a command throw, right? Yeah. Like, on the most basic level, um, when you're starting out, you'll have people uh, either jumping while they're inputting their grab, or when they jump and as they're landing, they input it. So when they land, Mm -hmm. they actually end up grabbing the opponent if the opponent is next to them. And then on some kind of mid-level you do a move that you have that has long recovery. So it's kind of like a punch that requires a long time for you to get back to your neutral standing position. So while that punch is going out, you input your 360 motion. And then when your punch ends, you immediately go into a grab without jumping. So it's kind of like a mid-level. And then the most advanced level, it's, it's ridiculous stuff I can't even comprehend. Yeah, but no, that's what I was. That's what I was getting at. Is that's a thing you got to watch out for once people start to learn grapplers. Is it's called buffering, because you are inputting the move to while the punch is out, and it sort of stays in the game's input memory. I hope I'm not getting too technical, but basically, you can input moves a little bit early in most fighting games, and the game will remember the input, and then you hit the button, and it comes out, and that's buffering because you're adding it to a buffer in the game's memory. Um, and so, yeah, you'll see, like, you'll see these characters throw out punches, and you're like, why do they punch right there? There's no, oh, there's the command throw. Um, so you got to watch out for that. And if you're playing one, you got to make use of that, because it's great. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> grapplers also usually have the problem of being very, very good at lower-level play. Uh, people like to call them scrub destroyers, uh, because essentially on a low level, because... <sighs> I guess like the best reason why the biggest reason why they are so powerful on a low level is because they play by completely different rules, like more so than zoners, um, because they capitalize on the move type that usually isn't available to other characters. It's very rare, like the command throws. Uh, because mm-hmm. of that, you have to have a different type of defense against that, and they have a different game plan to other characters. Like they have a different strategy they have to capitalize on. So you're basically relearning the game when you're playing against them. So on a low level, they're um, they're really, really powerful. But as you go on higher and higher levels, they tend to be worse and worse simply because they lack the tools to deal with the other type of characters when they're at their best. So, mm-hmm. for example, a grappler against a zoner is always a nightmare. Or... Uh, let's say a Guilty Gear example, you know, Potemkin is Guilty Gear's uh, equivalent of a grappler. Um, but because he can only, like, grab with his command grab while the enemy is underground, whenever he fights uh, Eno, uh, who can just dash and fly into the air from the ground, he can almost never grab her. And that matchup, because of that fundamental mechanic, will always be always 
utterly terrible for Potemkin. So you have things like that, just like the way these elements from the game end up meshing, um, that grapplers get the short end of the stick. Mm-hmm. And another reason that um, they tend the grapplers tend to be more powerful early and, and fall off is purely an element of technical skill, because command throws in most fighting games you cannot combo into or out of a command throw except for some characters have command throws that do no damage and purely set up a combo, but those are a whole nother thing. For these grapplers, their their command throws don't... you can't combo in or out of them, and so they have to do damage equivalent to a combo, basically. And so early on, when no one can do good combos, that's a ton of damage. But later on, when people are really good at comboing, the throws just don't keep up with that. Yeah. I mean, they're definitely interesting to play. Uh, I, even though I'm terrified of playing against any grappler, um, and they're very interesting to play against, and they're very interesting to play because it really freshens up the game. I, I generally find myself sometimes just playing a grappler in a game I frequent for a few days just to uh, mix things up, uh, not to actually get good at it, but just to get a different uh, atmosphere from the game. Um, mm-hmm. But... Yeah, getting really, really good with a grappler is depends on two things: um, how the the actual game respects the grappler, and a lot of fighting games just don't like they don't really. A lot of fighting games feel like they don't like their own grapplers, um, mm-hmm. but then it also like on a higher level, it requires some insane execution to get all the things right. Um, if you uh, if you ever get interested in Guilty Gear. Uh, check out Fab, uh, F-A-B, uh, who is the, probably the best Potemkin player in the world. Uh, the things he executes when you actually go into training mode and try to do them yourself are impossible. Like, the level of execution required to do the things he does on a tournament level is... I don't know. Like, I, I literally go just, I might as well invest my next three years in another character because that's how long it will take for me to do a basic thing. That he does. Yeah. Um, I do... This is sort of a tangent, but I want to take a second to shout out... I don't know if this is a positive shout out or not. Um, so we're going to give grappler examples. And, you know, there's Zangi from Street Fighter. Everybody knows him. Um, and since I'm on my Skullgirls kick, there's Sarah Bella from that game. Iron Taker in Blaze Blue is possibly the most scrub-destroying grappler I've ever seen. His moveset and mechanics are built in such a way that he is hell on earth unless you know what he can do yes um i play uh, uh the person i play plays blue the most with uh he mained tager it's a nightmare to play against like and learning the game by playing against tager is also an even greater nightmare that's why i said earlier don't play against very exotic characters for too long um mm-hmm. Uh, Dagger is built so that every single thing he has is uh, so he can capitalize on his grapples. Uh, So his base mechanic is to magnetize the opponent, uh, which means that when the opponent is magnetized, if he does moves that can go, or he does like a command throw or some specific moves, the opponent just slides towards Dagger. And yeah. that alone is pretty good, but all his other specials and normals, they just cover areas where he can just go into a throw all the time. Like, I don't think anyone has ever given such a varied tool set to Grappler in a 2D game, and that's saying something because Tager used to be massive garbage, and they just decided in the last... Uh, installment to just make him really really good and I like I actually you, you may not be able to tell I actually kind of like Taker but um, I think in the context of that character Gadget Finger is the grossest move in any fighting game um, it's obscene so Blaze Blue is a game where you can, like, you when you get knocked down, you can choose to stand up immediately, you can wait and stand up, or you can roll forward or backwards. And Tager has a move called Gadget Finger that he does when you're knocked down, 
that just forces you to stand up immediately right in front of him. Um, it's, it is, it is, I have, when I didn't know how to play Blaze Blue basically at all, I've still, like, perfected people by just doing a command throw and then gadget finger and then another command throw endlessly. Yeah. Because I, you just have to study that character to know what to do about that or he's going to crush you. Yeah, um, it's basically because he forces you to, uh, Play at his pace is why I think people usually get messed up over Gadget Finger. Um, I just play Taker by just poking him with very long distance moves because I genuinely don't want to risk being close to him. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a very sensible response. Um, I know that was kind of that was kind of a, a tangent there, but I just my god that character. <laughs> yeah. Um, and another thing, just um, if you're playing a grappler and you're starting out, a lot of grapplers have a lot of health, right? And you may need to change that. Like, it's easy to think like, "Oh man, I've got so much health, I'm like, I'm unstoppable," right? The thing about that is, if you're playing a fighting game and your character has a lot of health, it's usually because your health is a resource for things you lack. It's because they've given you a bunch of health because you're going to be taking a lot of hits and there's not much you can do about it. Your health is a resource that you spend in order to get what you want. So, like, if you're playing a grappler and you're getting pushed around by zoners, that's just going to happen. It's okay. You're not playing wrong. You yeah. need to spend that health to get what you want. Yeah, I, I think that's a very... Uh, that's usually a concept that's hard to grasp when you're starting out because the game... Every fighting game has a concept of perfect or flawless victory or whatever and rewards that with a special message. But sometimes, like, you don't really... It's not really bad to lose to a perfect. Um, and it's not really, like, uh, bad to win without a perfect, if you could. Like, it's it, it contributes nothing. And, you know, sometimes you do want to just risk or spend your health uh, to win a match. You know, because if you have an armor move, for example, like we mentioned earlier, um, that's not going to stop you from taking damage, usually. That's going to... Uh, depending on the game, but that's sometimes still going to deal you damage. It's just that they're going to stop you from moving. Uh, so it's kind of mm-hmm. you uh, spending your health to get something out. I'm going to quote uh, Vin Diesel from Fast and Furious. It doesn't matter if you win by an inch or a mile. Winning's winning. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's sort of... I think that's the whole, the whole Monty there. That's our, our breakdown of the of four basic archetypes in fighting games. You're going to play, you're going to see there's a whole lot more, you're going to see stuff that doesn't fit into any category because it's so weird. And hey, maybe we'll talk about some of that stuff at a later date, but this is the stuff you need to get off the ground, and and from there, you'll probably figure it out yourself. People are pretty smart. Yeah, uh, it's just worth mentioning that uh, usually if if things don't fit fit in these four archetypes, uh, they might be just varying degrees of these four archetypes. Like you, you can have a rushdown grappler. It's not unheard of. And also, mm-hmm. um, a lot of these archetypes are really dependent on the actual game they're in. Um, I've played fighting games where uh, the game's official grappler only had two command throws and nothing else that would make him feel like a grappler. But because there's nobody else with that kind of tool set, he becomes the official grappler, even though, you know... Geef from Street Fighter is much more of an actual grappler. And then you play games like like Marvel vs. Capcom, and you're like, well, everyone in this game is rushed down. And you're not entirely wrong, but there is nuance still there. Morrigan in Marvel vs. Capcom is still a zoner, even though she can also rush down because everyone can rush down. Yeah. So, you know, it's always degrees. But I think that's it from us here. Do um, you want to shout anything out at the end here, Mia? Um... Well, if you enjoyed the show, uh, feel free to give us a review on iTunes or a like on YouTube or just yell at us on Twitter and tell us, hey, this was good, bad, ugly, pretty okay. Um, We're open to all sorts of uh, comments. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you want to find me on Twitter, you can find me at 6264. That's written out as words. And then if you want to find Mio, you can go to M-D-K-I-I. That's, you know, Roman numeral two. Um, and yeah, we're, we're very open and accepting of feedback. Any support on iTunes is great. 
on, on YouTube as well. Thank you to Mio for taking care of the YouTube side of things. And, uh, uh, yeah. See you all next month. We'll see you next month. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye.